Um, so this is going to be module three, a continuation of everything that we built on yesterday, but um, sorry. So it's a continuation of what we've sort of been building up from yesterday, but for today, modules three and four, we'll actually start covering pharmacogenomic analysis. Um, so a bit more into the statistical methods and the code will be a bit more intensive, you'll see in the labs. But the learning objectives specifically for this module, first, um, is to understand the fundamental steps involved in pharmacogenomic data analysis for biomarker discovery. And then we'll be applying statistical methods. We'll look over things like the Pearson's correlation, concordance index, a few other ones, um, different methods for assessing drug response associations. And then the last is to differentiate between a univariate analysis and a multivariate analysis. Um, ben did cover this briefly in the first lecture, but we're going to go into more details. And also just recognize the applications in biomarker discovery. So just to sort of set the introduction for today, um, like we discussed yesterday, pharmacogenomics is a really critical field in bridging genetics um, and pharmacology and really trying to tailor that medical treatment for individual patients based on their genetic profiles. Um, it's really sort of the next revolutionary step in cancer treatment. So biomarker discovery is important for this because we need to find those markers that are able to predict drug response so we can tell who's going to respond to treatment and who's not going to respond to treatment. And this module specifically will dive into those techniques that we use in order to find these biomarkers, um, specifically using different packages. We'll also touch on our PharmacoGX um, package in R. So just as a refresher, this is what we talked about yesterday, but there's different components in a pharmacogenomics data set that we have to be aware of. Um, so first, your data is going to come from some sort of either patients or preclinical cancer models, so cell lines or PDXs. Um, within that, you also have the metadata that tells you things like the tissue type um, and things like that. Um, you have two major sort of data components. You have your response measurement. So this is um, sort of a metric of drug response or patient outcome, whatever um, you're trying to measure or even predict. And then you also have your um, whatever your biomarker is going to come from, so possibly a molecular profile molecular profile. It can also be things like radiologic images, um, things like that. But again, our workshop focuses on molecular profiles. So genomic data, transcriptomic data, anything of that sort. All of this we sort of compile into a nice P set for you. Um, so again, just a refresher, it's a nice object that kind of holds everything, organizes it to facilitate downstream analysis. Um, so that was sort of the data component of the workflow that Ben also presented yesterday. For today, we're going to be focusing on the next steps, which is briefly into data processing. We did touch on this a bit yesterday, um, but sort of going over the rest of the steps. And then finally, that predictive modeling step that gives you those biomarkers that we're looking for. So very briefly, the steps that are involved in this entire um, data analysis portion. First is data pre-processing, so things like quality control, normalization, and handling missing values. Again, we touched on this yesterday. The second is exploratory data analysis. So it's always a good idea to sort of look at your data, make sure that things are looking right, have sort of just an idea of um, what the data is looking like and what you can kind of expect from your results. And then the third is the actual statistical testing. So this is trying to find those associations between your markers and your drug response and finding those markers that are significant and could potentially be your candidate biomarkers. And then the fourth step is to validate your findings, um, confirming findings in independent data sets. Um, we'll talk about some other met methods to do this, but this step is really important to sort of build that confidence in that biomarker that you discovered. Um, so the first step, and we won't go into too many details because this was covered at the end of module two, um, but it's data processing. Um, so we sort of went over some ideas from yesterday, but again, this step is really important to make sure that you have high quality data for the rest of your um, analysis. Um, the second step is to sort of visualize your data. So this sort of goes beyond um, looking for variants like we did in quality control, but it's sort of a bit similar. So here's, for example, where you might consider doing um, visualizations by um, tissue types or different variables that you may want to consider having in your models. Um, you can also do clustering to identify sample groupings. Um, you can also just easily do like distributions of gene counts, things like that, just making sure everything looks right um, before you go down and use um, the data for your pipeline. The third and probably the most um, 
important step is going to be your statistical testing. So this is where you actually try to measure the associations um, or correlations between the feature that you're trying to measure as a biomarker and the drug response. Um, we'll look into a few different methods to do this in the upcoming slides, um, but this is sort of gonna give you an output and this output could be a measurement that sort of is the predictive value of that feature that you're looking at. And then it tells you if it's a potential biomarker or not. Another step here that's important is something called multiple testing correction. When you do, when you do discovery analyses, for example, if you're looking at every single gene um, in the genome and you're trying to correlate it with drug response, just from the sheer volume of genes that you're testing or a sheer volume of associations that you're testing, you're gonna find some positive hits, so some candid biomarkers just by chance alone, um, just the way that the statistics works. So something that we can do is multiple testing correction, and this sort of corrects the amount of um, hits that we get, or sort of those positive associations that we get for the amount of testing that we do. And this sort of reduces the amount of false positives, which are just those candid biomarkers that we get that just happen to be from pure chance alone. And then the fourth and final step is to validate your results. Um, if you're doing a machine learning approach, you can do something called cross-validation, where you take your data set, um, you can split it into different um, sections. So if this row here represents your data, you can split it into these five folds. So you have one, two, three, four, five, and then you do different iterations. So maybe you do the same process five times, but in every single iteration, you take one fold um, as your test fold, and then the rest as your train fold. So you train on this data, and then you test on this data, and then the next time you do it, you train on this data, and you test on this new subset of data, and you kind of go through it, and that way you're sort of feeding the model different variations of that data to make sure that your model is kind of giving you the best possible output. Um, when you're doing things like concordance index or Pearson's correlation, like we'll talk about, the step isn't T required. What's a bit more relevant would be validating an independent data sets. So if you train on, for example, your GDSC, you have a subset of cell lines, it's from an institution, um, you get really great results. Now you wanna see if those results will translate into data from a different institution. So maybe you train it on GDSC and then you test your results on CCLE. Um, or even better, you test your results in mice models or patient data if that data is available. Um, and all of these really just sort of, again, adds that confidence that these biomarkers we're finding are robust um, and only if we know that they're robust and they have that strong predictive value across different settings, can we really trust that they could possibly be translated into clinical use? Are there any questions up until this point? Go ahead. How would you for people enter that by the trendy and S? Like, which progression was it for the trendy and which progression was it for the S? So, a very common sort of split is the 80 20. So, 80% of your data is trained and 20% of your data is test. Um, and if you do the cross-validation, for example, here, you, you're not sort of splitting it once. You split it once, and then the next time you do it, you still have that 80-20 split, but now it's a different 80% of your data and a different 20% of your data. Um, but again, this is for this is if you're doing um, linear modeling or different other modeling approaches. Yeah, then with the 20% left over, when you're working with that, like I'm working with the Kenya, and mm -hmm. I pretty much they all have different types of and it's very honest. Yeah. So how can you trust the what's left over in the 20% that not every single patient is actually different? Mm -hmm. So, you know. Yeah. Um, so that's sort of why cross-validation is really good because in your first iteration, if you have the first half is 80 and the second half is 20, um, and maybe if this half or this section just happens to be populated with a biased group. But then the next time you do it, now you're training on say like the later half and then you're testing on the first half. So now you're testing on a different group and maybe by doing that split, the bias is a bit more, um, or the bias isn't so concentrated in one group. And then if you sort of integrate all those results, your model is less likely to be skewed um, based on any biases that were in the data. Does that make any sense? But then when you're doing that, you're reusing the same data set, right? Yeah. Different to create virtual data sets. So, how does the iteration learn from the first iteration? It doesn't necessarily learn from. 
what's expected because you already did the first step to the training. It doesn't necessarily learn from the first iteration. Um, you're training and testing the model independently throughout every every iteration. Um, and then you sort of combine the results at the end. Yes. Maybe minimum number of samples that you have to do in the data set that you execute in the data set? Um, I don't know if there's sort of a standard number of samples. The answer is usually just as many as possible, but there would be some sample sizes that you could definitely argue are too small for machine learning approaches. Um, I probably can't give you a number, but it sort of also depends on the task you're trying to do and the model that you're trying to um, predict with. If it's something a bit simpler, like a linear model, which we will talk about later today, your sample size doesn't have to be too crazy, like it doesn't have to be within thousands. Um, but if you're doing something like a neural network, which I think we'll touch on tomorrow, that one is a bit more, you definitely need a bigger sample size and you can sort of see why tomorrow, but it's just because without a big sample size, you will not get sort of concrete results at the end. Um, but you'll see sometimes we have data sets within like the sizes of 50 that people use, especially if it's patient data, you're very limited in sample size. And so you see studies being done with that sample size, but with cell lines, we have um, within the hundreds, even CCLE, for example, has a thousand. Um, and so when you're doing um, modeling there, you do have a larger sample size and you probably got um, a bit more concrete results. It's also true for uh, like doing expression data on their side, like when you come into James and five some six samples into a group. That, in that case, you can go explain the data. I, I wouldn't do this with six samples. <laughs> Yeah. Any other questions? Okay, I think I switch over with Nikta now. Perfect. So I have 45 minutes to go over a few slides, but I want to make sure that um, it's customized to your needs. So I'm going to show why next slide. Show of hands, uh, who here knows what are parametric, what's the difference between parametric, non-parametric uh, statistical tests? One, two, okay, great. So when we talk about parametric, non-parametric data, we are essentially talking about the distribution of the data. If the data is normally distributed, then we are able to run parametric tests on that data, meaning we use variance, standard deviation, mean, and things like that. But when the data doesn't follow a normal distribution, can be any other distribution, um, that's when we use non-parametric tests. And in that case, we don't rely on uh, mean, standard deviation, things like that. We are uh, dealing with ranking of the data usually or um, median of the data, okay? So we have two um, categories of tests that apply to different data sets. We have non-parametric tests for non-parametric data or data that doesn't follow a normal distribution. And we have parametric tests that we apply on data with normal distribution. Here I have a summary of the test. I borrowed it from my stats course. Um, for the non-parametric test, for example, depending on um, how many groups you're dealing with. Sometimes you just want to um, test something in one group. That's when you can, that's what I mean when I have the type of input data. Sometimes you are comparing something between two groups, um, but two groups are coming from different samples. That's what I mean by two groups unpaired. Sometimes you have data from one sample, but two different time points. That's when you have a pair because same sample, right? And more than two groups um, will be referred to as multiple groups. Any questions here? Okay, it's clear. Now we're talk we want to talk about associations, relationships. If we have a big data set, say we have a data set of gene expression and um, so we have a sam we have a data frame of samples. We have their gene expression, say for just 
for the sake of example, just five genes. And then we have the response to a specific drug. We want to see if there is any relationship, any association between expression of each of those genes and the, re the response of the patients to the drug. That's when we do association analysis. One thing that we look at when we are doing association analysis uh, is the strength and the direction of the analysis. Here you are looking at two um, variables, say gene expression, expression of one of those five genes that I mentioned, and drug response. And when you plot them against each other, you can see a clear linear relationship between the two. When the, there is a positive association between the two, when one of them increases, say when gene expression increases, drug response also increases. So they have the same direction. That's why you see a positive association. And when they have a negative association, it means that as one of them increases, the other one decreases. So they have a negative association. Sometimes you make a scatter plot of your variables and you don't see a linear association. You clearly see a pattern, but it's not linear. It's non-linear association. And sometimes you just don't see anything. There is no association between the two. We have an example here. Any questions here? Okay. Now let's look at uh, linear associations. One of the main ways for um, studying linear association or evaluating linear association between two variables is using um, correlation analysis. We have two types of correlation analysis. One is Pearson, the other one is Spearman. In Pearson's correlation analysis, we measure both strength and direction of the relationship between two variables. Um, Pearson correlation coefficient uh, ranges between zero, minus one to one. Minus one and one show that the, show the strength, there is a strong correlation between the two variables. As it gets closer to zero, the correlation disappears. When it's negative, it means the, very, the correlation between the two variables is negative. And when it goes towards one or it's positive, it means the correlation between the two variables is um, positive. So we're looking at strength, which is the absolute value of the correlation coefficient. And we have um, direction, which is defined by the side, sign of the correlation coefficient. And this is how we do it in R. There are two functions that I know of. One is core test, which gives you the p-value of the correlation, as well as the correlation coefficient. We also have core from base R, which um, doesn't provide the p-value. So if you want to look at the p-value, you might be better off using core tests. And the inputs are uh, the two variables that you are mm, measuring the association between. So yeah, just like I mentioned earlier, if it's closer to minus one, there is a strong correlation, but it's negative correlation. If it's closer to one, it's a positive, strong correlation. And in the context of drug response gene expression or biomarker discovery, when we see expression of a gene as it goes higher, drug response also increases. We say that there's a positive correlation between gene expression and drug response, and for negative um, correlation, it's vice versa. Are we good with correlations? Okay. Wait, can you go back one sec? I also just want to point out that when you're doing your analysis, because the data is so noisy, you're very rarely going to see the ends. It's usually going to look like um, the stuff put in the middle. Just be aware of your analysis. Oh, yeah. And I also have to measure that, um, mention that. When you are looking at your data, in reality, if someone says correlation of 0.3, you would say, oh, no, that's not a good correlation. But when you're looking at biological data, actually, it's good. <laughs> so don't have high expectations. OK, concordance index. Anyone familiar with concordance index? OK, 
good because I figured all of you know correlation. Uh, we had Pearson correlation as well. That's for nonlinear, uh, sorry, non-parametric uh, data. Mm, so concordance index uh, is when you have non-linear distribution, non-linear data, non-linear uh, relationship between the two variables. And instead of looking at the strength or direction of the association between two variables, concordance index looks at the ranking of the pairs that are concordant or discordant. So it doesn't really have anything to do with the data itself, but the, but the ranking. For example, we have these five individuals and our model uh, predicts drug response based on gene expression for each of these five individuals, right? And then we compare this first one with the second one. First one, third one, first one, fourth, first, fifth, and we do it for all possible pairs in our data set. And then we look at each pair. For example, our model says this um, individual has a better response compared to this one when we're looking at this pair, only this pair. And then, then we check, then we reality check that. And based on our data, we see, oh yes, that's right. Individual one has a better response to treatment compared to individual two. So that would be a concordant pair. So we have one concordant pair here. Then we look at the next pair, one and third individual. And our model says this one has a better response compared to this one. We, we reality check and it's false. So this is a discordant pair. So we do that for all the possible pairs in our data set. And in the end, we use this formula to calculate concordance index. The number of concordant pairs compared um, divided by the total number of pairs that we have in our data set. Concordance index function. Any questions? Where is concordance if they are different? No, if they're the same. It's not about them being same or different. It's about our model predicting okay. their comparisons. Like that's what I think. That's the model. Mm -hmm. Because it's just that's your model. So you just say, looking at both two is my model working and then you test with so many times you can and mm -hmm. you yeah exactly concordance index is one way to evaluate your, the accuracy of your model you want to see how good of a model you have within the context of pairs okay. so yeah matches mm -hmm. Yes. So we look if we're looking at this black and green people here. It's we our model says this green person is a better responder compared to the black person. And we look at our data set, the actual data that we have, and we see that's right. This green person has a better response compared to black person, and that is a concordant pair. Is it clear? Sure. Mm -hmm. S put comma in front of the X. That means that, that comma means all genes will be added in the analysis as well as drop Y. So what you are looking at here in the code, yes? So I suppose this is a data frame and what I can, it's, oh, you want to draw? I can do it. I think it might be easy to draw. Okay, sure, I can do that. have a matrix or a data frame like this. Your row names are gene names and 
this is gene X, for example. This is gene X2. Oh, and, and your data set is called gene expression. When you want to get just this row, the way to do it is you do gene expression. This is the name of the matrix. And then you have row index and column index divided, separated by a column. Row name here is gene X. That's that's exactly what we have with it. So is there like a data fields to like a CSV that's by separated by the formula is that what it means? Oh, this is the rule. When you want to subset, when you want to subset a data frame, there are a few ways to do it, right? One of the main basic way to do it in base R is that you have the data frame or matrix name, and then you have the row index, comma, column index. In this example, the name of our data frame or matrix is gene expression. I'm just replacing this with the actual row index here. It could be one, two, three, four, whatever. Here, our row names, our rows are named. So we have names for each row. This is the name of the row. It's gene X. And then I can, if I put one, I'm just going to get this first one. It's going to be row gene X, column one. But I want to get all the all the columns, that's why I don't put anything here. But this is what you see, okay, clear? Okay, and we have the same thing for drug response, drug light. We have a data frame, drug response, and yeah. Any other questions? Concordance index is clear? Okay, so let's say we calculated the co concordance, concordance index, how do you interpret it? If it's one, it means that all the pairs in our data set are concordant. Look at here. So it's going to be the concordant pair. It's going to be the same as the number of pairs. So it's going to be one, right? If it's 0.5, it means that it's random. And if it's zero, it means that all the pairs were discordant, so because the nominator here, here, here is going to be zero. So, concordance index, yes? It's very similar, but this is in the context of pairs. We're looking at pairs this time. Um, some people say this concordance index is generalized way of um, interpreting ROC curve that you are referring to, true positive, true uh, false positive, things like that. Mm, so we are sort of avoiding the limitations that that might have because we're looking at pairs this time. It's very similar, you are correct, but we're looking at pairs this time instead of each individual thing is true positive or true negative. Are we good? No? <laughs> um, maybe I can try to find something. I think I have a slide that I can share with you actually. Okay. Um, I think we covered the interpretation. If there are no questions, then we can look into um, how to, the approaches that we have for biomarker discovery. Say, I mean, Ben covered this yesterday, uh, just to, uh, as a refresher, uh, we said sometimes we have a data set. Again, let's go back to our five genes, sample size, drug response for all the samples in the data set. We look at one gene at a time and we, we want to know if the expression of this gene is higher, P patients are responding better to this drug. So we look at one gene at a time, just univariable. So in our model, we only have one variable. 
But sometimes we want to look at all the genes, all the five genes or more than one genes, two genes. So um, this time we are looking at all the genes multivariable uh, concurrently, concurrently, sorry. So that's when we have a multivariable model. And this can be in, in the context of linear or um, non-linear non relationship between the variables and the output. And when it comes to multimodal um, analysis, say now, before I was just looking at uh, gene expression. Now I want to look at the mutations in those genes too, or their methylation. So instead of just looking at, looking at one modality, one profile, I'm adding other layers to my analysis too. So now I have a multimodal um, analysis. Questions? Okay, um, in this workshop, we will be, in this module, we will be only covering univariable and multivariable models. Okay. For univariable models, we just use simple linear regression. Here in R, this is the way to do this. This is linear model. And then you have your Y and here is X. Y is the de dependent variable, meaning its value is dependent on the value of the independent variable. So drug response, whether a patient would respond to this drug is dependent on its gene expression of the value of the gene in that patient. So gene expression is the independent vari variable here and drug response is the dependent. I said it correctly, right? Okay. And it's simple. We have uh, one column of drug response, one column of gene expression. We only have one, one variable here. But when it comes to <clears throat> multivariable, just like I said, instead of just looking at one gene, before we had TP53, now we have a bunch of other genes too. Or it doesn't have to be a gene. We can also, here we're, we're looking at patient's age as well. So, it's more than just one um, variable. Right, it's also have to use plus, so can you give a different way to each of those variables? Or how do that um, for this LM model uh, function, we use plus. Just like the, go ahead. I was gonna say the plus doesn't mean you're adding the variables that badly. It's just a bit of- Yeah, but it's this, yeah, I know it's just the, like, the scripting. Yeah. It's exactly this. It's just to see if we can have some kind of, not just say, look at those three, but look at those three and also say this one, put some more weight on it or something like that. So that goes into non-linear models. If you, um, ah, okay. I don't know if you remember, but there's a linear multivariate and non-linear. So that would be the layer below. It's the one that it's just another question. Yeah, so when you have a univariable model, this is what you have. You only have one variable, right? And if you were to add more, this is exactly how you would write it in your code. And you will be predict predicting the weight for A, is the weight for each of those features, which can be anything, gene or age, to predict your adjustments. Sure. For concurrent analysis, um, can we do that analysis between a gene that has high expressed versus the very low expression or negative versus the expression of each particular gene? How 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 do we do that? I mean, <laughs> no, I mean in one co in what context? Because um, a gene and we are looking at one gene and its drug response or one gene and survival of the patient, right? So we're looking at one gene at a time, right? So if I go back here, we say 
this green patient has a gene that is highly expressed, right? And we want to see what is its drug response, and we predicted it with our model. Our model says this patient is this patient's response to this drug is has an AUC of 0.8, for example. Okay. The same model says this patient that has a lower expression of that gene has an AUC of um, 0.4. Okay. So based on the prediction of our model, the lower the AUC, the more sensitive the patient, right? Based on the prediction of our model, this patient has a better drug response compared to this patient. So this is agnostic of the gene itself. It's based on the uh, outcome between the two. Now, in the context of your question, what I was asking is that, what are you thinking when you are saying that? Because it's not about gene gene, it's about gene drugs drug. Does it answer your question? Clear? Okay, great. Um, that reminds me, I should mention here that concordance index is usually used in, in the context of survival. That's why you see in the, hmm, in the function, the default is survival time, survival event, because we're considering if you're censoring or not. Um, but in drug response, this is how we use it. Just the way I told you. So in, in uh, the more and more common way to do it, people look, people calculate the risk of someone, uh, say, dying, and the time that they survived. And then they put that into the concordance index function. For example, the model pre uh, predicted that this green one has a higher risk of dying and this one has a lower risk. And then we look at their survival time and we see if this is concordant or discordant. Okay. Pardon? Yeah, yes. Yeah, you can do that as long as you can just interpret it with your concordance card. Okay. Now, univariable, multivariable analysis have their own advantages and limitations. Obviously, univariable models are simple, but maybe they're oversimplified because it's very rare that just one gene, one event is driving a disease. Um, but because of their simplicity, they're um, easier to interpret, and that's why um, clinicians like it. They use it in clinic. That's why it's been so popular so far. But multivariable models, just like Ben mentioned yesterday, well, we have more complexity. It's good for research, but it's been so far complicated to apply it into clinic because of the complexities. Okay. Um, I think this was our last slide. 